<laughs> just that. coming down. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome, Kat, to the uh, postcast for your episode, episode 11 of She Does. I'm Elaine. I'm Sarah. Hi. And I'm we're Kat. excited to have Kat as our guest. And for those of you who listened to the episode, you learned a lot about her background, but I would just like her to introduce herself up front um, about who she is and where she is and what she's doing. Thanks so much, Elaine and Sarah. My name is Kat, and um, my most recent uh, claim to fame is being on the She Does podcast, <laughs> episode 11. It was really great to, to, to hear the show last week, um, featuring my work uh, mostly on High Rise, which is a project of the National Film Board of Canada that I've been directing for the last seven years. Um, a huge, epic <laughs> experiment in documentary content and form, um, resulting in, I think, like five major documentaries, um, mostly interactive, but overall at least 20 different iterations of live presentations, performances, um, installations, written work. Um, we had a, a major radio show uh, come out of the work. Uh, really a wide array of, of media that we've been uh, putting out for the last seven years about essentially urbanism and what it means to be an urban species in the 21st century. Awesome. Could you... Um Take us through the journey of what it's been. You launched Universe Within last Tuesday, is that right? That's right. And so what has it been like? Tell people a little bit about what Universe Within is and, and sort of the strategies you're using to get it out into the world. Yeah, sure. So Universe Within is the last project of High Rise. It's, um, I would call it a feature-length online documentary in the sense that there is approximately 70, maybe 80 minutes of material that you can go through if you were to go through everything. Uh, now, we certainly don't expect you to do that. We, we've uh, sort of broken it out into these uh, 10 to 15-minute type modules that you can, you can do at your own leisure, and you can do as many or as few of them as you'd like. Um, and um, it tells the story of uh, digital lives, the invisible digital lives, of uh, high-rise residents around the world. We shot in, uh, I think, 20, 20 or so locations around the world. And then we wove these small, short documentary stories together um, with scripted, um, fictionalized uh, hosts that we shot in uh, Connect 3D um, devices and um, re-represented back in your browser uh, using WebGL, which is an open source um, 3D uh, opportunity in the browser. So that's that's Universe Within. And um, we launched it uh, last week on Tuesday, as you said, Elaine, with two media partners. So the Globe and Mail here in Canada, which is the national paper, paper of record here in Canada, um, and the Atlantic City Lab, which is the Atlantic's um, place for discussion around uh, the global city. And they've done some phenomenal uh, research and writing over the last, I think, they rebranded a few months ago, so they, they, but they were called uh, Atlantic Cities prior to that. So they have a really amazing track record globally on urban issues um, and have a fantastic collection of writers. And a few months, quite a few months ago, um, in the fall, we began discussions with them about how to launch Universe Within through a special report at, uh, at City Lab. So what they're doing uh, over the course of two weeks is dropping an article every day that relates to the High Rise project. Um, and most of those story ideas come from us, come from our work, but the, obviously the writing and the, the research um, has been done by the Atlantic team. Um, but the stories are all mostly coming out of the, the, the um, a lot of the areas that we didn't get, I feel like I didn't get a chance to get into as much as I would have liked. So it's really, really exciting to see uh, such top-notch talent um, writing and bringing these stories to the world as we as we say goodbye to High Rise and uh, introduce the world to Universe Within. Yeah, that's, that's such a smart strategy. I love that. I'm definitely going to take ideas from that. Um, we had a question about... Um, so you've had support and backing from the beginning for High Rise within it, with the NFB, but how would you advise those who don't quite know or don't quite have funding to begin to articulate their project, what their project will look like, because, you know, in the podcast you talked about the product comes out of the process rather than defining the product and then finding the process to get there. So what advice would you have to makers that um, are pitching to people, potential funders, without knowing their product? 
Um, I guess I would take a step back a little bit and think um, think more broadly about the kinds of relationships that you can build around a subject area or an area of interest, and um, and and instead of pitching a project, uh, think about collaborating on something together. And I think that that right away it creates a different dynamic in terms of you're not trying to get people to buy into your idea, but what you're actually walking into is saying these are the things I'm good at. Um, what are the things you guys are interested in, you guys are good at, and how can we pool our talents, our resources, and our energies to make something bigger than any of us could do on our own? And it just it just reframes the whole way in which you end up going about raising the money that it takes to to make the stuff. So I, I guess that's that's that would be my one a contribution that is maybe different than a more classical or traditional approach to journalism or documentary is just reframe the whole conversation by starting with collaboration and relationships rather than I've got an idea and I've got to find money for it. I like that. That's a great way to look at it. Um, the next question was more about you said or he says um, you're just you describe not being challenged by school and having a thirst for more challenging inspiring creative endeavors and um, this person Jonathan is wondering uh, how you feel about today's students? How, do they have the same difficulties with access to information, social information, and how can the education system adapt to handle students' access to the internet and technology in a way that can define the student experience in a more open and challenging way? Wow. <laughs> you know, I feel like this is I, like Miss <laughs> Universe. <laughs> like, <it's> right. <laughs> this is like a total Miss Universe question, and like. I, you know, I appreciate that question because I think it's a huge, huge thing. Like, I hated school. I couldn't stand it. From the day I walked in in kindergarten uh, to the, we had grade 13 here in Ontario. We don't have it anymore, but we had grade 13. Like, how awful is that? So from K to grade 13, I hated it. And as now, that, now as, as you know, I have a daughter, and so I, I'm actually having to rethink this again because <laughs> I spent most of my life, I hated it, don't want to think about it. You know, it's terrible. So yeah, and I think the landscape of uh, what what happens in the classroom with regards to digital the the digital lives that people carry on their own now is just so so enormous. Um, I think a huge, from what I understand, we have an amazing education department at the National Film Board of Canada, and they do great work. And if you're interested in seeing how um, really really smart uh, curriculum alignment with great media product. Um, can be done, definitely check out Campus. It's a fantastic uh, portal uh, to the NFB education world. And teachers share stuff in there. It's a really, really participatory environment. It's great. Um, but I think part of the challenge in a lot of, uh, a lot of classrooms is, is getting teachers to have access to digital materials and issues of digital literacy themselves. So I think it's, it's about a building capacity on that level. And I think in some places, Students know way more than than the schools themselves or the teachers. So I could be wrong, and, and definitely I'd love to hear from from people on that. But that seems to be that that seems to be a big issue is is building capacity. Absolutely, Sarah. Do you want to ask the next question we got? Yeah. Um. Well, I, I had a quick one. Um. But did you ever get overwhelmed with the uh, there's so many in in high rise. There's so many like facets and like different like branches of it. Um. Did you ever get overwhelmed, and like, how did you talk to yourself to like keep it under control and kind of keep track of everything? Um, I love to multitask, so um, in some respects, um, it's like it was the perfect ecosystem for me because I got to have a lot of ideas going at the same time. That's uh, definitely overwhelming for me and the team and the partners. Like, what I what's going on here? Like, where where is this going? For sure. Um, I think it's just taking one, like always keeping an eye on the horizon. So always keeping like that that full scape of all the things that are possible. But ultimately taking each day one day at a time. So what can we do today, and how can we how can we start one project in pre-production through production, and then start building another one behind it, so that we were kind of in a really nice flow of uh, project to project within a larger program. And I think that's the key is just trying to. And it's a very, very hard thing to do, right? Like it's trying to keep everything, everything in its place. Like not let one project kind of get ahead of itself or fall too far behind. 
Um, so, and, and, and again, very, very lucky to have uh, the team, uh, Heather Fies, the uh, community media director who's been with, with working with me uh, for 11 years, like since Filmmaker in Residence, same with uh, our technical director, Brandon Bertuin, um, and producer Jerry Flahive, uh, uh, our new producer, David Oppenheim. I mean, a core team uh, just couldn't have done it without that kind of incredibly close collaboration um, and people just really taking on their areas of expertise and doing it so well. Do you have like a system, whether it be um, sticky notes or to-do lists or apps or things that you use to keep, um, whether it be for storyboarding or to keep things in order? I just, you know what, I'm, I'm obsessed with ideas around how to take notes, but ultimately it's just, this is my favorite thing, just a moleskin and like I just, and I write free flow, so I just, I just do it chronologically. And I've just, I just have hundreds of these books and I just keep it. And I, and I actually have a, um, photographic memory, like a, not, not photographic memory for things out there, but I have, and I'm sure a lot of people have this, is like a photographic memory of where I wrote something on a piece of paper. And so I'll, I'll remember exactly kind of the angle and corner in which it is. And then I'll just like keep flipping and sometimes for a very long time until I find that page. So that's, that's for me is, and I, I you know, I have a digital calendar, but really my, my handwriting is, is, is where I stay sane. Yeah. I often feel that when I write something down, I'm much more likely to remember it than I put it on a digital list. Totally. Know, that is, but, um, Not that I don't try those digital lists. Try them. I do try them. <laughs> yeah. I still use them. But, um, so that, the other question, one of the other questions that came in was, and I think this is something that people really appreciated about your episode, was this idea, the, the whole idea of rethinking what a subject is. Um, mm -hmm and not thinking of a subject as a subject. And so this question has, I think is trying to get to that. And what advice does she have for documentarians getting access to people to be accepted and to work with individuals, you know, in, in different communities, whether it be, you know, with the First Nations community you worked with or people in the high rises, like what is your strategy and what advice do you have to people to sort of earn that trust? Um, I think uh, you have to earn your trust and, and you can't just expect people to walk into, have you walk into their lives and, and have access to everything and anything. Um, and except when I'm doing investigative work, which is a, it's, it's got its own kind of, um, I think it still has a code of ethics and it has a, yeah, I, I strongly believe in, 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 in that. But if you're doing collaborative um collaborative work, participatory work, um, it's about, it's not about um, conning people into getting access to their lives, like it's, it's just not that, and, I, I, and you can hear it when people are like, how do I, how can I get access to these people? It's like, if that's where you're at, then you're not even approaching this properly. And it goes back to that, the funding question earlier, which is building a relationship. So um, working with people rather than digging into their lives. So I would never want to work with somebody who doesn't want to work with me. Like that's just not, that's not what the work that we do is all about. Like I'm not into barging into somebody's apartment who doesn't want me there. Um, and and uh, cons consent for me is a much larger, bigger um, uh, act of agency. It's like, yes, I do want to be part of this and these are my terms and this is why I want to do this and as, as a former subject, and these are the things that are in it for me or for my community, and this is how we can work together. So it becomes more of a partnership. It's not about me getting something out of somebody else, but it's really about uh, creating terms and, um, and, and, and a plan and, and setting goals for, for the partnership. To, to follow up on that, did you... So did you um, receive any kind of uh, rejections when you reached out to people like that, or particular people that were living in the high, any of the given high rises and did you just kind of have to move on and find somebody else knowing that they didn't want to participate? When we first started in the high rises here in Toronto on Kipling Avenue, um, it was a pretty disenfranchised place. Like we'd knock on doors and nobody would answer. Like you knew people were inside. You could hear the music, the laughter, the cooking, you could smell the cooking, knocking on the door, no. Nope. Like literally, you could not get people to open the door. That was not the culture in those buildings. It was a, it was very, very difficult to even get people. Like you'd stand by the elevators trying to recruit people for a photography workshop or whatever, 
and people would just like completely walk by. And and it's not, you know, it's it was pretty audacious of us to go in there thinking that people would <laughs> would come out for our event. It took a lot of work, and not just on our part. It took a lot of work on the part of our partners, um, United Way, and um, a few key residents that trusted and believed in the process and f felt ownership over it as well. It was their workshop and it was their place to begin organizing in the buildings. And so that's that's ultimately how we were able to um, to gain the trust of some people. We never got a huge, huge group, no way. And it was a constant um, issue because the, trend, uh, the, the, the buildings are so... Uh, transitional for people. People are moving in and out all the time. Like it's just you're constantly seeing at the beginning of every month there's just stuff moving in and stuff moving out. Um, and so uh, even the community itself changed dramatically over the course of the time that we were, we were there. When we began in the buildings there was a really large Haitian population. It was quite a few Haitian families. Um, but then the earthquake struck in Haiti just as we were beginning our work. And um, Everybody on mass in the Haitian community moved out of the buildings because they were they wanted to be closer to their communities um, either here in Toronto on the other side of town in Scarborough another it's another suburb where there's a larger Haitian community or a lot of people moved to Montreal because they wanted to help out um, uh, with rehabilitation after the after the earthquake and they needed to be closer to the diasporic communities so then the, suddenly the buildings were empty like there was just a, Every second apartment was was completely uh, empty, and then over the course of a few months, um, an Iraqi Christian community started moving in. I'd heard that there was a building that was full of Iraqi Christian uh, families uh, down the way, and I guess it filled up, and so people started talking, literally in the refugee camps in Syria, about two six six seven on Kipling Avenue in Toronto as being a place that they could find an apartment and be close to the community here. So now, today, the same building, it looks exact. if you drove by today, and you drove by it back in 2000, what was it, when we started, 2009, you would not spot a difference except maybe the playground, um, but entirely different place inside. Wow. So you went from knocking on doors to what approach did you pivot to after that? Uh, well, eventually, we just uh, we had an incredible um, person named Maria Saroja Panambalam who started off as an apprentice uh, through an apprenticeship program here in Canada with me, and then she ended up staying with with us on high rise until the bitter end. Uh, just uh, she, we had her last day with her uh, a while back. Um, she's now studying geography. She's doing a PhD in geography with uh, our academic partners at University of Toronto. So it's a wonderful sort of journey that she's taken um, and we've taken with her but she really spent a lot of time in the buildings just talking to people uh, it was just spent time there and um, and uh, that really that really helped get that first group going um, and build that trust I have um, one question about the this isn't one of the questions that came in it's more of a personal question but I've always been fascinated by how you've been able to sort of control um, the quality of the content that's coming in from all these places around the world. And I know um, I'd heard a little bit about, I think maybe you had told me or someone had told me about sort of this book that you had made or like this process document that you had made for the photographers around the world to sort of uh, illustrate like what you're looking for, the mood, the tone, the style, whatever it is. And I'm wondering, I think that would be really helpful for people to understand if they're hiring filmmakers from around the world to document these things like how do you bring it all together so that it it looks good together and it's it's palpable and people can like make sense of it once it's actually put together yeah it's a big challenge for sure um, aesthetically but also editorially um, and so uh, we had a core team here for both out my window and universe within um, we had the same pretty much the same core team um, Heather Fries, Maria uh, myself, associate producer Sarah Vollum, and, and on Universe Within, associate producer uh, Sarah, sorry, Sarah Ruda and Kate Vollum. I just combined their names by mistake. They're they're good friends, so I always mix that up. Um, uh, and uh, and then we had a, a team of researchers as well from the University of Toronto academic side, so Alexis Mitchell and Brett Story. And so we would meet um, weekly, and then the team would go out and work with the respective uh, local researchers, journalists, photographers in places around the world to develop stories. But we would really hammer them out in those sessions to really get the focus and make sure that um, it would 
it would form part of that constellation of the larger story that we were telling. And so we, at one point, I think if you, if you look at our full list of stories that we went through, I'd say there's maybe 50, 60, like a lot. And this is over two, three years. It's a major, major, this was not like uh, the stories of Universe Within were not put together in a day. You know, it was really, it was a s several years and a, and a big core team and lots and lots of people on the ground. Um, and, and the other thing that I've always been interested in, in since Filmmaker in Residence, I mean, I've always been interested in photography, but in particular in a lot of this, um, the, the, the stuff that we're working with many, many remote teams, uh, photography is a really interesting way to uh, both highlight um, a particular point of view, so you have like incredible points of view of photographers from around the world. We have worked with some phenomenal people, but it's it's much easier in some ways to to handle that quality control aesthetically, um, and so that's why we chose the photo plus audio format rather than a video format because in some ways you can actually create a unifying aesthetic um, much easier than than with video, I think. And then the editing was all done here, so that really helps kind of tighten tighten the package. And before we get back to this big set of questions, I just have one more question. I since Sarah, you can jump into um, with eight minutes left. I um, I'm curious what you feel your responsibility is, um, and like how often do you still talk to residents you work with, and and just trying to keep up those relationships, um, and how important is that? Is like where do the you know the role between filmmaker, facilitator, and friend, like how do all those things sort of come together and how do you manage those relationships? Um, I'm, I'm pretty careful uh, personally and we all have our own styles so the diff like different members of the team have their own kinds of relationships. Um, I'm pretty careful, uh, I tend to be pretty like I'm a professional, I'm a filmmaker, and um, I, I, we're very friendly and we're very like collegial, but I wouldn't say that uh, we're friends in the sense that we would um, spend hours on the phone together or go for coffee. Like I, it, it is for me a professional relationship, and I think that to me that's the strength of it um, is that uh, thinking about first lived experience as in its in a professional capacity, in a in a capacity that it has a really legitimate and valuable contribution to make. On uh, on the work that we do as as documentarians or academics. So so for me, it's it is about. Um, I, I mean, I, I, the the word professional kind of I don't even like it very much because it Im implies like um, a corporateness to it. But it's not that. It's about um, keeping in mind always the power dynamics and the um, the reason why we know each other and how we know each other. So. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm making sense on that, but it's like uh, I don't, I don't, um, I don't want to overplay the, this idea that somehow we're doing this because we're friends, because I, I think to me that's not that's not accurate and it's not honest. And and so often documentary and I and I appreciate it documentary documentarians because we get to know each other so well with the people that we work with we are like oh we're such great friends and I just work with my friends and it's I, I see it quite differently you know I, I my friends are are, are 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 a very different world for me it's not that I don't work with my friends or that the people that I work with aren't my friends um, but I have pretty strong strong lines about it and 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 I. It's out of out of an ethical um, consideration. Yeah. So, for example, uh, sorry to continue that thought more yeah. concretely. Um, from filmmaker in residence, um, long after we finished filmmaker in residence, academics at St. Michael's Hospital started up. Um, were able to get a grant to continue the work with some of the young parents of no fixed address that we had worked with for five years in filmmaker in residence, and they continued the project on. Uh, I think for two or three years. So they only just finished that about a year ago. So the work continued, you know, and that was what I was really, really proud of that that um, the young parents with whom we started when they were like, some of them were 16, 17, 18, 19, like now they're they're in their mid 20s. Their kids are growing up. Like it's pretty phenomenal to see, you know. And uh, in terms of the the high rise that we work in, a lot of people have moved out, but there are still a few key people that are there, and we, we keep in touch. And uh, you know, it's I was up there last month uh, for a tenants association meeting, um, and uh, yeah, so it's it's definitely uh, such a such an honor to see 
how people's lives develop and change and how communities um, form and, and stay together. Yeah, and to, and to ducktail on that, there's the whole like side of like change. Like, do you feel that this there's an activism side to what you're doing? Do you feel that there's um, an element of wanting to make change with the media you're making, or do you see it as as a, a separation as well as, as sort of that professionalism versus I don't know. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I think um, uh, definitely that's the roots I come from. I did not. I did not start in film or any kind of media to become a filmmaker. Um, for me, it was really about um, about politics and my concern for politics, and and I saw media as a way to to do my politics. Um, that's changed slightly in the last eleven years, in the sense that the National Film Board of Canada is an agency of the government of of Canada. So um, we have to be careful on how the work is uh, is understood as as not being advocacy or a lobby group. Um, so I would say that the work that we do is engaged, um, and uh, I, the work that we do, I think, um, for me, if we can contribute to other stakeholders' ability to really affect change, then we've done great work. So in that sense, it's about, um, it's a, it's about creating tools for people to, to change the, 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 their health outcomes in the case of filmmaker and residents, their living or housing conditions in the case of, of high-rise, um, and definitely that's, that's the driving force. That's, that's, the, that's the reason why we're doing it. Awesome. Um, so let's see. Uh, Kat mentions having an exciting feeling about knowing how far media can reach. And for all the media professionals out there, what is the importance of media in our everyday lives? Does she believe, what does she believe is, is its role in our everyday lives? Oh. Huh. <laughs> like, is the question, do I think that media can affect change, or? Uh, I don't know. We can skip that question and go to another one. <laughs> <laughs> just repeat it. I'm, not, I'm not, just not sure what, the, what is the question. Yeah. I'm having trouble deciphering it too. What's the importance of media? It says for media professionals out there, what is the importance of media in our everyday lives? Does she believe? What does she? I'm sorry. What does she believe is its role in our everyday lives? Okay, so I can I can argue like from a devil's advocate perspective that I think um, in general I think we media professionals think we're a lot more important than we really are, <laughs> um, and 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 I think. Yeah, like we need some humble pie, and we also need to think very critically about what, what, it, what kind of change we think we're affecting. Maybe I'll leave it there. <laughs> that was that was awesome. <laughs> I, I like humble pie. That sounds good. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, one I think one last one, and then we'll wrap up. Um, how does Kat come up with the stories she wants to follow? Um, and I, and I know that High Rise was driven by your previous experience with filmmaker in residence and seeing the, the sort of separation racially and culturally. Um, but moving forward, uh, do you think High Rise will continue to be, you know, those, those themes will continue to go throughout your work? And, uh, yeah, talk about that a little bit. Um, I've always had a preoccupation with the digital, for sure. Like, the digital always somehow ends up in there somewhere, so definitely uh, that's part of what I'm fascinated by is how these technologies are, are shaping the inside of our brains and our relationships and our politics and our, our, our human rights. Um, and, and that is the other, that my, my lifelong preoccupation is human rights. So those will somehow manifest themselves in future work for sure. Um, but uh, the lesson I learned from filmmaker in residence, and I think I carried it through in high rise to a certain extent, is that um, I'm not precious about being the author of my own idea. That the best work, or some of the most challenging, exciting work that I've ever done, has been really by throwing myself in, like just full body in, to somebody else's idea. And and so some of the best stuff that we've done has I, it's not like oh this is my authorial point of view as a documentarian it's like oh this is it this is something that is really needed by this community and how can I how can I jump in and just roll up my sleeves and make this happen and so in that sense I'm I I I want to to keep that in my life is that openness and ability to 
to, to work on, on other people's stuff. I love that. Cool. Well, can you give us uh, a parting goodbye of how people can find you and where they can see your work and um, anything you would like to update us before we sign off? Um, well, just that my daughter's getting older. <laughs> she's going to be, she's about two and a half. She's going to be two and a half next week. So that's pretty exciting. And um, yeah, I'm still in the same place. I'm at High Rise. Um, that's where you can see a lot of my work. And otherwise, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. And uh, happy to chat with anybody, share any of the resources from the work. Like you mentioned, the creative brief. So if anybody is interested in, um, in seeing that, I'm happy to share it with you informally and um, uh, personally. So just write me and uh, see you around. Cool. And can you tell us something funny your daughter said recently? <laughs> oh my god, she said something really funny. Uh, she quoted E.E. E. Cummings last night. Because we have this beautiful children's book, um, an E. Cummings poem adapted to a children's book. And we're just sitting at the dinner table and we're, we're, there's a little quiet moment. And she looks up at me and she just says, you're my fate, my sweet. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my god. Oh. So she's making literary references now. So I love that. To see her. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us on this, and thank you for everyone who sent in questions. Um, and this will post on YouTube right as soon as we sign off, so that if you missed it, you can see it later. Uh, I'm going to press stop broadcast, but you two ladies stick around. So thank you, everybody, for... Thanks so much. <laughs>